Welcome everyone. We have some regulars rolling in. And I've invited a few new people that have not heard a confirmation, but that's just fine. Uh, let's punch through some developer topics while we have Hans and Corvin. I would love to know if you have any news to report or need any assistance in testing or otherwise. Hans, I see you're unmuted. Have you made any progress with our friend Vitali? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, there's nothing to report here. I haven't heard from him. And uh, well, there's nothing happening in, on that front. Understood. Um, but I got, I, I got a question for Corbin because I haven't been paying attention to his um, GPU work recently. Um, is the uh, GPU pass through stuff uh, upstream integrated already, or is that still waiting for integration? So it's depend on your GPU. So for AMD GPU, everything is upstream in Beehive. Um, there's only one thing missing in the EDK2 uh, for Linux guess, because um, without this, uh, um, without ROM parsing in EDK2, the Linux guess is unable to uh, um, to detect the video bias of the GPU and then it can't handle the AMD GPU. And okay. um, yeah, and for Intel, um, it should work for Linux because it doesn't require the Intel operation. Um, but for um, Windows, there's some stuff to do. Okay, and I, I guess NVIDIA isn't up, just isn't upstream yet. No, and it's also not working on my internal branch because we don't use NVIDIA graphic cards very often, and so I haven't tested this. I see. Okay, thank you. Was that missing run pausing on Linux so, guests on AMD, or did I mishear that? Rum. R -O -M. ROM. Oh, ROM. Oh. Thank you. That makes a lot more sense. The, so the Visa uh, option ROM? Mm, so the, the uh, video BIOS. Okay. So uh, NVIDIA used to work. There was a talk at EuroBSD uh, Con 2019 about what worked and what didn't. It turned out that with the uh, right few lines added to XORCON, the Linux and FreeBSD drivers were able to initialize an NVIDIA GPU inside Beehive when completely passed through. So masks from the host, but uh, the Windows driver, it was unknown at the time if a, such a argument can be passed through. But I haven't tried the Bev Yuan. He tested uh, the speaker tested on, I think, a GTX 1080 Ti or something and some workstation GPU. Yeah, I saw some articles about it, but I wasn't able to figure out if there is some. Um, tutorial how to test this so uh, his slides included the config snippets and those if they're not available for download at least the talk was recorded okay so yeah but for example our systems i know you uh, need a windows guest yeah for example for windows is won't work i take a look into qemu how um, NVIDIA GPU pass-through is handled there, and it looks like um, NVIDIA mirrors the PCI config space in some If I remember correctly, oh. the problem is that with the configuration he used, which isn't encountered on real hardware, uh, the driver is told the PCI ID, and then it can 
initialize the GPU, even though it hasn't been brought up far enough to be auto-detected for attachment by the driver, because uh, the video BIOS has not initialized the card in that case. Because when you put it into the mode where you pass it through, it's put in some deeper reset and has to be reinitialized and all the fun stuff. But uh, haven't tried it for in a long time. Jan, is that the correct talk? Oops, stop uh, playing. No, no, stop. Let me. I put one in chat and it sounds correct. And there is a recording. one in uh, Lil Hammer. Yeah. Program. Yeah, by Michael Chu. Okay, cool. And now I've got that. We have guests with hardware accelerated graphics. Okay, cool. That's in there. Welcome, Daniel. Oh, the slides and are available as PDF, and yep. the link still works. Yep. Uh, let me drop the link in chat. Uh, I do see the slides on papers.freebsd.org. Oh, it's also on okay. the, their site too. Lots of options. Um, but and it depends on your main board and so on. So it's fragile. Anything else okay. on VGA pass through? VGA? Uh, well, pass -through? GPU pass through. Sorry. And Corvin, I know Patrick was doing some EDT, EDK2 support, or was it um, whose firmware? Um, uh, drawing a blank on it, but uh, unmodified ROM support, which sounds like it might resolve one of those issues. Um, what do they call that? Uh, ah, supported by Zen. I forget the, the ROM. Anyhow, uh, Jan, anything to report on your S6 and other work and CTL? No, I didn't have the time to work on it. And related to that, I was hoping to bench some boot times, but with different numbers of CPUs, but I've had not a free um, moment to do that. Yeah, it would make sense to plot this in two dimensions as uh, against a core count and memory. Yes. And, and I was thinking also- Wired uh, and I could... unwired memory would be worth trying as well, because oh, otherwise it could be that if you don't wire the memory down, down uh, when starting the guest, you're not immediately putting memory pressure on the host kernel because it can just lazily allocate the memory. Uh, so on that note, I was thinking I could also uh, count the number of VM exits on both that and especially time counters. Yep. Uh, but at the same time, it would I also be thought really interesting if you're able to to uh, capture the startup times per application processor for each application processor. Basically, if you're creating a guest with thirty vCPUs, uh, does the first ones take as long to the first application processor take as long to start as the last one? Something like that. Should be possible with D-Trace, but so basically does it get slower just because you have allocated this, this number or does it get slower every time you add an active application processor to a guest? This would be the kind of thing which um, you can hand off to a developer mm -hmm. to please take a look at this part of the code. <laughs> Naturally. Um, so a super naive question on that. I was thinking just to kick into single user mode, um, 
just so I'm not waiting on RC to do a, all its things, but is there a way to have single user mode simply jump directly into bin sh without asking the user? So Cause... what do you want? Uh, so you want? My initial thought is to boot into single user mode and immediately shut down, just so it's like up and down. But then well, you can do that something different. Yep. What's your approach? Um, the thing is, what's happening? Single user mode is implemented by passing an environment a kernel environment variable from the bootloader to the kernel, and then the kernel passes this on as a command line argument, basically to init. So if init sees a flag dash s. Sure. It enters single user mode, but the FreeBSD loader also supports uh, the init path variable, which can be passed to the kernel. And this overrides the default search path in the kernel used by the kernel to search for potential executables to launch, uh, launch as first process so that okay. you can launch something other than init, like a shell script as a initial process. Of course, if this process ever dies, the kernel will panic. But that's not a problem for your use case. If you so only want to shut down? Basically, it could exec into reboot with the right arguments, reboot or something, or, or just, uh, yeah. But related. I know, or you could single, override the RC. Uh, there's another level I think you can override to uh, switch the RC script. So what in it launches to uh, enter multi-user mode. Ah, that might be helpful. Uh, but the init path is nice because uh, if you, you can basically break your system to put it in this boot time measure mode, where you just measure beehive start to exit times. Yep. As a That's function exactly of it. memory and core count. Yep. Uh, but um, entering the bootloader and um, and unsetting the variable is enough to regain normal use of the system. So you would uh, enter the bootloader prompt. Of course. Uh, input unset init underscore path. And then uh, without it, the kernel defaults to its built-in path, which is something like try has been in it, uh, o in it, and slash rescue in it, and so on, to try a bunch of different paths. Uh, okay. I think the default search path is, isn't documented anywhere except in the kernel sources, but this is such a deep implementation detail, you only encounter it uh, if you try to replace the init system for some reason. Uh, and then it's very useful. That's specifically init path or a different? Init uh, underscore path. OK. And then is there a flag that can simply punch past the request for bin sh? Um, or just manually flag setting it. You would uh, it. put in uh, an executable or even scripts work uh, to be run instead of in it. Oh, I get that. But by default, it going into single user mode asks you if you want to run bin sh. Uh, that's implemented in, in it, I think. I did mention the like what line number to look for, but is there a way to just set a flag to say, hey, auto choose? No, it? but I nope. think there's okay. a way to pass a kernel environment rebel read by init, which then controls which path it tr tries to execute to get into multi-user. Or you could just uh, patch your RC script. It is the script uh, executed to run the FreeBSD init system. So the RC script with RC order and so on. If you just put something on top of, at the top of, of this file, it's just a self shell script after all. Yep. Uh, you could put some hook in there. There's a command line tool called knv to uh, easily read kernel environment variables from user land if you have uh, root access to the system, which of course was by definition you has, yeah. and it's long before uh, there's any chance that some init script has raised the secure level and so on. Okay, so then because it's. 
I've done it in clumsy ways in the past, but I very much just want to document how to have a VM startup yep. immediately do yep. nothing and shut down just to get that the, the yep. a more accurate time. So uh, when you uh, run boot on the loader prompt, yep. The arguments to boot are passed through to the kernel, which passes them through to uh, init. So if you have replaced init, you can reinterpret those arguments. I would recommend staying compatible to the commonly used arguments. Uh, sure. Because. I'm at the mercy of whatever's in base by definition. So. No, you're not. Oh, I that, well, I don't want to point to a package. You're not. You're. <laughs> it's open source. You you're allowed to change it, and if you of break course. it, all the parts are yours to keep. <laughs> yes, exactly. Cool. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Daniel, welcome. Uh, curious if you have any news or excitement. I do have some headlines that might interest you. But I'd love to hear from you. Um, I have another idea how to measure the startup time. Just one. Go ahead, Jan. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, if you just pipe the system console um, to some kind of script reading uh, from standard in, uh, you could look, um, look for some line on the system console. OK, well, let's have that conversation. Just. Uh, <laughs> Yep. Cool. Uh, Daniel, welcome. Sorry for the false start there. Uh, do you have anything new to report or request for assistance? No, I think I'm in good shape. I uh, nothing nothing exciting in the in the beehive area, though. I might give uh, GPU pass through another shot. Um, so uh, yeah, so maybe in a couple weeks I'll have some. Uh, testing to do in, in that area. Can you describe your use case? I, uh, well, I was going to. I have a I have a server that is headless, more or less. But uh, you know, it would just be nice to. It's not for. It's not for. Uh, you know, GPU number crunching. It would just be for uh, for desktop on a on existing you know workstations that are headless at the moment. Um, so I can get a little more use out of them. Um, I have had perfectly fine success with uh, with uh, PCI pass through before. I just wasn't able to, um, and I, I think this was this was just a mistake of mine. I should have been able to to run those in Linux, right? Uh, GPU. Um, uh, yeah, we for, actually for ran some through reason, that a second ago. Hans asked Corbin yeah, about the same. Right. Check the minutes there. It's like, hey, so. Um, yeah, right. There's a you know a matrix of you know I'll paste in the chat here of what is supported, be it as a Windows guest and a a so Linux guest. Go in ahead. short, uh, on Linux, the integrated into GPU should work. Right, and then Windows not quite yet, but yes, for probably 14 release, or for you know in the next uh, six months or something. Oh, I. Yeah, I'm not sure about the state on um, 13.2. Uh, I think it should also work on 13.2. Um, and yeah, in 14, it should work. Fantastic. And, and for Windows guests, uh, AMD GPUs should work. But um, yeah, there you have to take care about your GPU model because AMD has a long-standing uh, bug that their GPUs aren't able to uh, get resetted. Um, and I, I probably, oh, sorry, go on. Yes, so this is a hardware bug and the newer AMD GPUs don't have this issue, but mostly all older ones have this issue. Can you name a generation or model number or series with and without it? Wait a moment. Sure. Gladly. So I'm sure I've brought this up on a call before, but uh, so I'm, I'm sorry to ask Please. again. But there's what's the what is the black magic in and I, I think that I don't think KVM does this. I think um, 
maybe only VMware does it, but you can get uh, some sort of, you know, some sort of basic graphic acceleration for multiple running VMs at the same time. And I don't know what, you know, what that's, you know, what that feature is called, but is that, would that, you know, sort of ever happen in Beehive? Like, you know, is that like a, fi- is that a five year away thing or is that not possible? Or is that, uh, you know, you have to be too married to the GPU companies to be able to do that? Um, there's something called ZIO GPU, which is basically um, indirect, OpenGL and maybe these days Vulkan renderer. So something like mm-hmm. Red GPU basically. <laughs> and it requires basically running, letting the hypervisor act as a GPU accelerated application on the host. So you basically send some kind of white code to the hypervisor, making use of shared memory mappings to then instruct the GPU driver on the host to take care of the computation and either display it or put it in some shared memory. The problem with this is that it uh, exposes a vast attack surface because GPU drivers aren't hardened um, against this kind of attack surface. So for example, I've seen the NVIDIA driver leak um, texture content between applications running as different users on the host. How interesting. Yeah, suddenly it's not, not fun if you run uh, want, want some application and suddenly you find that your supposedly unalicialized GPUs still contain uh, parts of your user interface where basically you have screen catchers in there. <laughs> And so long, so there's no, there's not going to be interest in having. Oh, a, there's going to be interest having a feature for this. Case for it, but I don't see anyone willing to pay for it. Basically, and I don't see anyone able and willing uh, to do it uh, for free. <laughs> so, I I think, s- yeah, I think the only. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, just wanted to say that I think no one is working on it. But for example, the Akron hypervisor um, has some kind of um, yeah, um, splitting the GPU and passing it to multiple VMs. And they are using the functionalities of the DRM driver. Uh-huh. So, and this... Um, yeah, it's the i915 driver, but it's included okay, uh, in the DRM. But and it, they can... Let him finish. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no problem. So, and um, yeah, if you make use of this DRM driver, it should be doable, but you have to find someone who is working on it. So here goes. I've been with a colleague tinkering with Proxmox and an AMD Fire Pro S7150, and as of yesterday, a system delivered with an X2, which is a double width card and twice the just literally, literally cores. Um, it works quite well with Windows 10 and 11 VMs. It is a constant adventure building a Linux kernel to support uh, to support it, and the official repo is heavily neglected, so it's it's kind of bleeding edge, but we definitely are throwing uh, FreeBSD and Linux VMs at it in the hope to do thin clients. So yeah, I'm happy to share notes as appropriate, but it's been mighty frustrating. By the way, Michael, yes, I've shared a link in the chat um, to a project where someone developed a um, driver for Linux to work around the reset bug of the AMD GPUs and there's this table with supported devices and uh, all of these devices should be um, affected by the reset bug of the of AMD. Excellent. I definitely have that in the minutes. And you had mentioned the Acorn hypervisor. Were they doing something special? So on 
Um, Intel GPUs, they support three different kind of pass-through. One uh, kind, uh, so the first one is the full GPU pass-through, which is called GVTD. Yep. Then there's uh, GVTG and GVTS technology. And um, yeah, that's um, what I've mentioned a few minutes before. Yep. So um, yes. the Acorn makes use of the DRM driver to um, pass the part of the GPUs to multiple VMs. But the difference there, if I uh, understood the documentation correctly, is that they are making use of hardware support for partitioning the GPU resources into multiple uh, PCI Express functions and then only one function per GPU is passed through. Uh, yes. Which is restricted to certain GPU and CPU combinations, even in, inside Intel's portfolio. I'm not sure, but I think most Intel GPUs should support it. So but it could for be For some that... reason, I think they've locked it away in, in most desktop uh, chipsets. So the better laptop chipsets and some desktop chipsets support it. And... Well, to be honest, I didn't test it much, but I had a desktop cable lake uh, Intel CPU, and there the GBTG approach uh, kind of worked. Which is a lot better than from an isolation point of view, because uh, the virtual GPU uh, as power virtualized driver just uh, is a normal accelerated application on the host and basically, if you allow Beehive either by leaving the um, by leaving the uh, capsicum sandbox or exposing the DRM devices to it, you kind of provided an uh, uh, you de declared untrustworthy code as trusted. <laughs> Let's say it like that. So the isolation then is question really. Hans, you brought up the topic. Do you have a use case to describe or a, a, a pressing new opportunity? <laughs> um, no, that's what I was really. going to ask. Well, that, the like, thing, what's the, what I'm... like besides desktops? Like, what's the like? Would it be for remote, remote, de remote desktops, or you know, what? Because I was thinking that if I could run multiple remote mm -hmm. desktop servers and share some GPU power, that might be one thing that could be possibly useful. Um, um, there's something, is it called Looking Glass or something on the NVIDIA side for KVM, which uses the uh, on GPU supported by NVIDIA for pa partial pass through. You can then uh, pass through, I think it's, uh, it's respected to the workstation GPUs mostly, but you can pass through a virtual GPU in hardware and use the encoding engines to stream it or to or have a shared buffer between the host and guest so that the host can or some other guest can inspect the basically indirect rendered uh, image. So this, this is hardware and what it, but it, but it doesn't work with Beehive yet. Uh, no, it so. doesn't work with Beehive. It only works as far as I know with uh, KVM on Linux hosts. So something like Proxmox has documentation on how to set it up. And that's so useful, in the... for example, to allow running your Linux workstation and still boot a guest for Windows application or games or to even, uh, because it's low latency and high performance enough to run multiple gaming workloads on a single big box. But, but uh, within, 
within a few months, I'll be able to have one uh, RD, RDP or RDS server with a, with a full GPU inside it um, per per host, at least. So that's, I mean, that's that's certainly better better than nothing. So for the normal, I need a Windows guest as we as desktop. I found that the performance of the Windows native RDP server is quite acceptable. Yes, it is. Uh, if you provide it with enough fast CPUs and good network support, and there you get something better than most uh, guest uh, uh, video and KVM solutions because. Normally those are quite laggy and don't you have problems with keyboard mapping and so on. And if you just have a gigabit of faster network and um, throw at least four CPU cores at your workstation um, with enough memory and so on, it should just work. I need to benchmark this with uh, with market data systems. I can't I can't explain it, but it but when I when I run RDP on a, a GPU having VMware guest uh, with Windows and market data systems, it smells faster. <laughs> I can't I can't explain it exactly. It just feels faster than than when I do the same thing with with equal or greater performance on a Beehive guest. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this it's is possible. all in my imagination. Days, and especially if you're using um, low power hardware. One of the things worth uh, looking for is the boosting behavior because lower uh, power Intel systems have a ridiculous uh, margin between base clock and highest uh, one or two core turbo. So if the scheduling and boosting isn't uh, correct, you may be running at one point something gigahertz. Uh, but you don't think that Windows is doing something magical no, with its with the GPU is acting as when your somebody's host. on RDP. And FreeBSD misschedules the guest threads on the host kernel, and which leads to bad boosting. For example, if FreeBSD puts equal lo loads on all cores, where some other hypervisor would um, only put the load on a few cores, allowing them to reach your full turbo throughput. The threads running inside the guest would get faster thread, so basically your vCPU would feel faster. And if you have right. a 3x I've... performance difference between base clock and highest turbo, Yeah, one trick I worked out with uh, Clara for SMT systems, is I pin every other core to a 16 core, um, uh, to, to a six, 16 vCPU um, Beehive VM. And then I would get the full performance of all those cores and block every other core. So, or sorry, block every other thread. So I get 16 full cores for a, a, a running Beehive device yeah, and then uh, you know that still doesn't solve the scheduler problem but at no, least i know that other threads aren't popping so up what you can do to work around this and allow the guest to be more or less smart about it is um to reproduce the subset of a topology uh beehive exposes to the guest in in its configuration and pin the vcpu threads and if you really want to get rid of the hyper threads, you can set a sysctl in FreeBSD, uh, uh, sorry, a loader tunable to disable hyper threading support. So oh, I didn't know you could do that on the operating yes. system level. I thought I had to do that. In you can that. So do I can, that on an, can I... or you can just, uh, if you want to be able to re enable it dynamically, I think there's a way to get almost the same effect by modifying the default CPU set. Which it sounds like he's sort of doing. Okay. CPU uh, said should be able to mess with that. But yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. By, that's what I meant by said representing the hyper thread as started. So it may have already put the core in a different configuration. I don't right. know. Right. That's a good point. Effect. But most of the uh, performance loss from hyper threading to the 
other thread on the same core is from resource contention at runtime, while it may increase throughput for most workloads in modern CPUs, some are penalized because you effectively reduce the cache capacity available to a thread. But uh, just to not summarize my anything there would be enough to make the full ca cache capacity of the level one and two caches available to each core. Yeah. But you don't think you, but uh, to to just just to get back to one of my original points, um, right. you, you don't think that VMware's access to a GPU has anything to do with the performance difference between uh, it, a uh, an RDP on VMware the and, and has VR. access to a CPU, of course it can use it to draw the Windows UI and then only stream the uh, GPU accelerated rendered image over RDP. Right. So, so VMware that's why that's allows access to that's why I, that's why I think that yeah, that ahead. makes a huge difference if the guest has access, for example, via uh, GVTG or something to a GPU. It can uh, run a Windows operating system with all the eye candy enabled and still feel snappy. Uh, in the RDP client, you can play with the, in the official one for Windows and Mac OS for Microsoft, there's a setting to toggle high resolution support which is things like 32-bit color depth and uh, higher resolutions and UI scaling. Disabling right. that reduces your, I think, to 16-bit color depth and slightly lower right. resolutions and so on, which also helps right. uh, CPU only uh, video output and compression. Because... And the other thing is in Windows, there are lots of tunables on how many decorations and transparency effects to enable or, or disable. But as far as I remember, it doesn't enable them, in, at least in Windows 10, uh, if there's no uh, hardware acceleration. So it should just default to something reasonable. But I haven't- Hey had Hans, to... I was sort of- Hey Han, I, 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 uh, I sort of was talking, we were talking at the same time and then I got into a back and forth. So I did I cut you off? Were you were you gonna say something about this? Hmm? Or Hans? Hans? Or yeah. Hans? Um, yeah. Oh. about what? <laughs> <laughs> we were just uh, the uh, I think uh production use cases for uh for for the GP Basco. Oh uh, I, I wasn't even like thinking servers. about a production use case. Uh, uh, I was just thinking with the holidays coming up and maybe I have some time to revisit the um, Visa BIOS, so actually video BIOS emulation for emulated uh, VGA. And um, I had that working once um, 18 months ago or so. And that was built on an early version of uh, Corbin's code. And I never got around to rebase that and anything. And if it's upstream, it'll be easier for me to revisit that. that. That was basically why I was asking. Is this about- it, uh, Was that? Sorry. Oh, I was gonna say something about, uh, uh, what is it, XHCI, because the FreeBSD machine on a FreeBSD, uh, on a FreeBSD machine on Beehive uh, has terrible mouse support. So I was wondering. If there's something in the in the same vein as as that, that would uh, that would help that problem because I think that that's probably one of the more embarrassing problems of BI. But it's it, I'm sorry, it's a slight tangent from what we're talking about. Well, you're not wrong. Yeah, that's you're an embarrassing one. Oh, I have Beehive. Oh, well, let's uh, let's run it. <laughs> I have Beehive. Let's uh, let's give GhostBSD a try in uh, in uh, in a in a Beehive VM. Whoops, my mouse doesn't work at all. That's yep. a pretty embarrassing it issue. Is. Um, if I remember correctly, the uh, Beehive VGA uh, and VNC server works with uh, the well, sure, yeah, sure. as mouse input to the terminal. 
I haven't tried to run a Xorg or Wayland <laughs> on it. Right. That's yeah. That's what I mean. Is that in order to get accurate mouse, you need XHCI. Uh, tablet support basically um, or else the pointer is off kilter with the actual movement of the mouse um, so if you run so if you run a, a, a freebsd or maybe i don't know if it's more than just freebsd but uh, a graphical and uh, freebsd uh, graphical environment without that option um, you you your mouse does not move at the, where where your pointer is pointing um, so it's sounds... it's pretty So now this is not a problem in, in Linux or, or, or Windows because you can have XHCI tablet mouse support. So VN, the VNC uh, server works fine. Yeah, I mean, obviously if you if you start a VNC server on the operating system level, no, uh, you get around this, but but every person that uses- for, uh, But while it doesn't help most users, um, it's, this sounds more like an X server configuration problem where it uses the wrong driver or the requires an override, which may have been pa passed through by other hypervisors, but not only it should work. And if you select the right input driver, you should be able to work with that. Well, without XHCI support, I haven't seen a single operating system that doesn't have a bad mouse offset but where the cursor doesn't Can't you just line up load the, the right mouse. driver for it? Just I mean, configure it in that's not true on any, maybe, but there's no, I mean, I, I'm talking about the, the frame buffer, right? yes, the I VNC, the, the, the Beehive, but I, I don't know. It the, doesn't, the I, I haven't seen an operating an system that does that. a device, if I remember correctly. It's supposed to be, yeah, but there's definitely an issue. You. There's, I know Vicky looked at it. Zero. Yeah, without yeah. XHCI, zero operating systems that I've encountered uh, work with uh, have a have a mouse offset problem. Now that this isn't this isn't the totally unique to Beehive. This also happens um, on a lot of BMCs, or you know, uh, the, like an IPM. I log in on a on a server. That it's quite common that this problem exists, but. Um, but I just, I just feel like from a, from a diplomatic point of view, this is a, this is a bug that, you know, the, or, or, uh, I mean, I guess this is XHCI support for free BSD. It's not actually a BI problem. Maybe. Correct. I don't know. And, and according to Vicky, we're at either, we either we're on our own or HPS needs to, Hans Petoslavsky needs to work on that. Uh, I have nudged Vicky about this and yeah, it keeps coming up and you're correct. It's, it's a bit of a, an embarrassment to say, Hey, you well, have precise mouse. We have a tablet mode and um, it doesn't work on our own operating system. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, I'm curious because if I remember correctly, this tablet device with absolute pointing device is exposed through a virtual USB uh, port to the guest. So basically it shows up as a USB controller with just one device. That sounds right. <laughs> and we have lots of different ways of handling mouse-like device or pointing devices. Yeah. Uh, especially if you include XORG from, oh, let's use the system mouse multiplexer and so on, and have it show up there, or uh, have the legacy USB mouse support in XORG or try to map it to uh, dev input no event. So I would just try if one of those configurations already works. Are those documented anywhere? Um, in the main pages ancient. once you have uh, XORG server installed. Okay. I'm not saying that it does work, but I would be surprised if none of them can be configured for uh, absolute pointing devices. Is that something you'd be willing to test? Just spin up FreeBSD with UEFI uh, yeah, sure. GOP uh, and as soon as I have time. install XORG. <laughs> hey, I hear you. It's, it's... I think um, a uh, yeah, I think one approach would be to talk to the the uh, GhostBSD people because obviously. Half of them are probably testing it on Beehive. 
So I could I could just run that by them in their Telegram channel and find out if they got a if they do have a workaround. I didn't find one documented, um, but uh, yeah, I think a frame buffer today for for release I think is the only is the only choice um, for 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 getting Ghost BSD loaded. Um, so, so with FreeBSD vanilla, there's probably another. Uh, there's probably another option, um, but that's that's something um, that I bet you the Ghost BSD people would know also. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on my to-do list. I'll I'll ask them if they've found a a workaround because that's something that should be you know pretty high in the in the Beehive wiki. I think because that that's a conversation that I've had multiple times with my staff members. I'm like, here's yep. this. Uh, Hypervisor software I'm using. Oh, by the way, it works with everything but FreeBSD. So. Jan, may I quote you on that? Try the EV Dev driver, input driver. Guessing man EV Dev. Is that right? So, That's how it's spelled. Uh, let's see. I had to fight with this for. Um, some kind of IPMI, BMC, and there was a configuration to get it working, but it's been years. <laughs> uh, so, you, so you saw the issue under IPMI and you solved it with the XOR By telling it or... you have this type of, you ever, either I had to switch from absolute to relative or the other way around. And it was, if I had to make sure it picked the right mouse driver and then tell it to use absolute or relative. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was a super micro workstation main board with IPMI. I'm not seeing a manual entry for EV dev or EV underscore dev. Hmm. I don't know where I found the fix for it. Um, FreeBSD. And of oh, course, EV it should work out of the oh. box and auto detect correctly. That's. Uh, up, up, up. Uh, there's a simple wiki page and then the manual page that somehow didn't come up for me. Manual four and, oh, well, there you go. Okay, ah, generic Linux input driver. Is that in base or external? Um, the driver is, so the driver registering as this is in base, but the part of Xorg using it as, Input to Xorg is a part of Xorg and so a port slash package. Okay. Uh, if you have any notes from long ago on that super micro IPMI, do let us know. That indeed keeps coming up and it's easy to forget about until you <laughs> give a demo and it's like, oh, dear Lord. <laughs> and I will take this silence to throw out my use case, which is a car dealership where you have all sorts of, as you put them, was it meat bags uh, of all ages on the showroom floor and having them disappear with a Raspberry Pi that has nearly nothing beyond pixie booting uh, that brings say a free BSD installation up with RDP access would be fantastic. And then all the heavy lifting um, is done on, in this case, Proxmox, if we can get it working, but hey, the problem is be fantastic. That, so if you want to run FreeBSD for graphical use cases on the Pi, there are a lot of issues. The Raspberry Four Pi 400 is coming up and working well and running Lumina as an RDP client. So it's okay. not entirely terrible. On and a web browser is all we need. The problem is that the GP, as far as I remember, the problem is that the Raspberry Pi these days are running in 64 bit mode because, of course, you want to do that on an ARM CPU yeah. capable of it. But with the GPU on the Raspberry Pi only uses 32 bit physical addresses. 
So any buffer used by it has to be wired into continuous physical memory in the lower four gigabytes of a physical address space. Yeah. Hmm. And it's still um, a strange Broadcom uh, conception, the whole GPU, the video core four on now, I think something five or six, the latest ones. So I had the uh, video driver for, uh, working on a Raspberry Pi 2 uh, and FreeBSD 8 or 9, something 32 bit, uh, but it never made the way to a 64 bit ARM hmm. because it's just such a uh, well, limited device. Yeah, but are you sure that the same limitations apply to this upcoming one? Uh, I think that's because the uh, even the Linux kernel developers rant and rave about it. But maybe someone has found a workaround with bounce buffering, which isn't completely uh, unacceptable. And Linux does have drivers which work and produce an accelerated fast enough. But on FreeBSD, this is going to be a challenge because as far as I know, you're limited to a frame buffer driver. Oh, wow. My web browser just imploded on me. Just one moment. <laughs> Fascinating. So I posted a link to a discussion about perhaps exactly that. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, answer, the, the, sorry, the answer is yes, you can write a 64-bit kernel driver to make use of these GPUs. It's similar to using a 32-bit PCI device in a 64-bit kernel. And it requires all the same um, inefficient workarounds or tight integrations when allocating memory to be shared between CPU and GPU. Noted. We're a little in the weeds on Raspberry Pi, but it was the motivator for my uses. Um, well, the Raspberry Pi is just the remote desktop client, right? Correct. So, so yeah. Um, how about I just but go ahead? Why? So I was going to say I would. I would think for for if all you're doing is an RDP client, yeah. that being a, just using a frame buffer driver would be acceptable. I mean, not great, but. Sure. Um, but the thing is um, on the Beehive uh, host side, I wouldn't try to use the Beehive VNC server. If I could help it, I would run a VNC or RDP or X11 or whatever uh, server inside the guest, maybe on a second uh, network interface or something. Like, if it has to be secure, put some kind of IPsec or WireGuard or whatever VPN underneath and then route it to the uh, client device. I would expect it to perform a lot better than the fairly slow uh, VNC server inside Beehive. After all, it's only meant to be good enough to install Windows because installing Windows over a serial port is uh, annoying, even for the server versions. This is true. Almost unknown to anyone. That is an understatement. Windows... <laughs> hmm? That is an understatement. Yes. Yeah. So I have found a guide once basically on how to install Windows Server 2016 or something over the emergency serial port interface. It can be done, but new Windows user <laughs> knows about this. And anyone familiar with running a Windows server just assumes that they have access to a glass wind video terminal, basically, and not just a serial port. Okay, uh, I'll just throw this out there. There, 
I finally got some answers on packaged base and there's a new proof of concept inspired by up.bsb.lv called alpha.packagebase.live, which has a little how-to and they would definitely love some help on wrapping up final issues for 14. Um, that's been a discussion for years upon years. And at one point I counted six different packaged base proposals, one of which was a complete joke, like intentionally a joke. Um, so there's that, so I welcome you to look at that. Go ahead, Jan. The one problem I had when I tried it out in some late 2019, early 2020, was that some of the uh, config files weren't properly detected as such. And so for example, the PEM configuration files got overwritten on every uh, update of the relevant package which installed them, which is a really nasty surprise when you have removed password login and went completely for SSH uh, login so that I would use PUM SSH to authenticate by starting an agent and loading my private key into it. Uh, only to find out that now I had uh, no password hash and um, password login <laughs> as only login source. So I believe the wiki gives a list of files that get clobbered so let's yeah. take a look there uh alias is fs group hosts you name it oh uh, well that's so in that's... the wiki page for oh yeah the last thing i put in the chat for what it's worth so yeah i talked to bob about it and he's going to say yeah i know and i'm, I'm close to uh rewriting it all and it's soon going to be perfect don't even bother with what's currently in tree uh, um, when was that conversation? Because a lot of things have been landing from Yeah, I think so uh, around Manu. your BSD con 2019. Okay, well. Slightly after. I've seen quite a few commits and hence this work proof of concept. So take a peek, see if it's still an issue. And in the news, I'll throw out that Zygmunaz has received a beehive plug in someone's like hey i need this a bit like on true nas and they i haven't poked at it but hey it's out there um and those certainly stood out but uh jan uh, i guess just going down the previous list uh, did you have a chance to document what what john didn't have documented for the configuration file manual page for beehive dash k uh, no. Do think about what those are, just because it sounds like a simple piece of information. Anyway. Um, well, if I remember correctly, it was something which was basically uh, it was documented in Beehive underscore config or in Beehive, and some of the information uh, is documented in one config format, but not in the other one. So just reading the Beehive uh, application and the beehive underscore config main pages against each other and checking if everything documented in one has an equivalent um, entry on the other would be required to find it again. Got it. But, and it's tedious. <laughs> right, right. It could just be that I missed it because it was out of order or something. Okay. So, but I lost some time because of it. Understood. Uh, CTL experiments. We are, we've hit an hour. Does anyone else have hot topics? I know we're all a bit crazed with end of year wrap up. Um, yes, uh, your correspondence with Math about CTL? Yes. The email? Uh, yes, it's possible to put a via LUN map to put a CTL port into a mode where it has access to none of the uh, LUNs. And that's what my um, Ansible S6RC configuration does. Basically, it create, I have one service to create the per uh, guest um, CTL port and lock it down. And then for each exposed disk of, of a guest, I have one service which adds this one uh, disk as a specified uh, LUN. So there are basically multiple namespaces, which is confusing because normally 
there's one n numeric namespace for LUNs, but inside CTL, every uh, port with LUN mapping enabled has its own LUN namespace, the LUN map, which maps from its port LUN namespace into the global uh, LUN namespace. Uh, yep. Yeah. If you're on the watching along, is that the syntax that takes care of it? That's what I figured out with Matt. Yeah, it was something we have provide only one of the two parameters. One yes. uh, removes uh, all restrictions again, and the other puts it into the mode where it loses access to all and has n nothing uh, configured, unless you have already added a uh, LAN previously. So basically, one removes uh, the exposure of a global LAN into the local namespace. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have anything, and enable the LUN map mode, then you have locked down the port, which is what you want to do. Yep. So hopefully that is it. it and I'm quite excited about that. It's, it's a safe and sane way for tooling to go through this uh, state, basically. create just If you tear down the guest, tear down its CTL port as well. Be, before you start the Beehive process, um, Create a new CTL port for the guest. Um, okay. Lock it down, tag it with some worldwide port number to find it again. If you break it up into multiple scripts, at least. Um, even then, it's a good idea to remove uh, CTL ports with no uh, worldwide port number because those are probably left over from some failed startup scripts. Mm -hmm. And you have a limit which a retry script can each easily re reach so it used to be that you could and have only 256 uh, ports on the system while he was there Marv bumped this to 1024 uh, because if he had to break uh, the abi anyway why not right. bump some constants and just pre-allocating an array of 700 something more pointers doesn't uh, hurt these days Okay. Well, any final thoughts, questions? Let's see what. No, nothing on IRC. Well, how about we call it there and meet in a week? Well, see you later. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Take care, everyone. Hopefully I will find the time to uh, test Muff's pa uh, patches, which I think have already hit uh, current. Yes, they have. So, uh, so I uh, only have to- The last uh, build has them, which is great. Yep. Okay, well, take care. Talk to you soon. Yep. Have a good one. Yep.